Well, hello everyone. It's April and today we are going to be chatting about the best books that I read in 2020. So let's get into it. It is a little bit dark outside. I'm filming around five, four or five and it's Ottawa. So here we are. I've got the overhead light on. Sorry about the lighting if that's upsetting, but I did want to share with you my favorite books of 2020. I had the best reading year of my life. I read so many books. I read over 100 books, which I never, ever do, um, but these are the best of the best. and I want to share them with you, and I have rated them in order, so we're going to end with my favorite book of the year. Again, this was really hard. Once we get down to like the top three or even four books, I had a really hard time um, distinguishing which one was going to be first. And if you ask me tomorrow, it's hard. It's hard. So let's dive in. Before we really dive into number 10, I just have one honorable mention. I didn't want to have a top 11, so this is an honorable mention. Such a fun age by Kylie Reid. I was sure this was going to land in my top 10, but I read so many good ones this year that it just didn't. Um, this follows a woman who is essentially a nanny for a white family. She is black and uh, the family asks her to take their young child in the middle of the night. I think it's like 10.30 or 11 o'clock on like a weekend. They ask her to take this child to a grocery store. Something's happened at home. They don't want the kid at home for a little while. So she goes and unfortunately she's stopped by a security guard. And the security guard thinks that she kidnapped this child, which clearly she hadn't. And it is the ramifications of that. It is about this white family reacting in a way that may be well-intentioned, but may also be slightly insincere. Um, we specifically follow Amira and her relationship with this white mother that she works for. And the, the relationship between them is, is really strange. It's basically what not to do as a white person, I, I feel. <laughs> um, and she's also dating someone in this book who is white, who also reacts improperly as well. And it was really fascinating to read this with my my 10th spot. So I'm going to dive into that next, but I really liked it. I know that some it's kind of hair or miss for some people, but I loved that book. But here we go. Top 10 in the 10th spot. We've got Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. Now, I think, I think I read this and then I read Such a Fun Age. And it was like the perfect pairing. If you want a good nonfiction fiction pairing, I feel like you can't get better than this. Maybe you can, but I, I can't think of a better one. Um, this is a nonfiction book about how feminism is leaving behind Black women, Indigenous women, and women of color. And it shows the myriad of ways that the white feminists are doing that, uh, whether intentionally or not. Um, it shows how feminism, mainstream feminism, has at its core and its center the white woman as being what who feminism is for, essentially. And this um, calls that into question and it raises... Um, certain issues that you wouldn't have originally thought of as feminist, as feminism. Like um, hunger is a feminist issue. Gun violence is a feminist issue. And these aren't issues that I, as a white person, shocking, had even contemplated as being feminist before reading this book. So this is the type of book that I would like to read kind of on a regular basis. I highlighted all through this book and I don't regret it because I learned so much from this book and it was just wonderful. It's also the only nonfiction on this list so you know it's good when. Number nine is a book that is going to make you cry and it made me sob 
This is Hamnet and Judith by Maggie O'Farrell. Um, this is the story of Shakespeare and his family. We follow Agnes, his wife. Agnes had gone through so much in her history, being a bit of an outsider, um, just having a really rough go of it in her childhood and, and teenage years. But she meets Shakespeare and they fall in love and they have children. One of those children is Hamnet, who dies very suddenly of illness. And it follows their relationship and them having the children and then it follows them after Hamnet dies. And you, you really are with them in their grief. Like this is probably the best exploration of grief. Aside from The Light Between Oceans, that I've ever read. Those two books just explore grief in such an honest and visceral way. And by the end of this book, I had finished the book and I was just sobbing. And I, I just loved how they show how grief can bring people together, but also tear people apart. It's very realistic in what grief can do. And I just thought it was brilliant. Number eight is The Color Purple by Alice Walker. I'm so glad that I read this modern classic book finally and I still have to watch the movie. I don't know why I haven't watched that yet but um, this follows two sisters but mostly we follow Celie. Um, we follow Celie um, throughout her childhood where she had like a terrible, terrible upbringing. Her father was abusive in all of the ways that you can be abusive. He was horrendous. She did finally escape her father only to marry a man who um, was, I don't know if equally abusive is right, but also was quite abusive. Um, but she writes letters to God and you read these letters in the first half of the book. The second half of the book is her writing letters to her sister, who she hasn't seen in many years. And you follow her sister's storyline as well. But this is really about female friendship. Like it seems, when I first started reading the book, I thought, oh my goodness, this is so hard and so sad and just it's just gonna be depressing. And it was really hard, but this also celebrated female friendship and female love so much that I just ended up caring about all of the characters immensely and it was actually quite joyous and I will never look at the color purple again the same way. You will understand if you've read the book. Moving into number seven, we've got My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. This was a hard book to read. Um, but I also think it was an important book for me, at least. Um, this is about sexual assault and sexual abuse. We follow a woman who is reflecting on her high school experience in which she had a romantic relationship with her English teacher. She has always considered it a mutual romantic relationship. She's even still in contact with this guy, Mr. Strain. Um, and it's only years and years later that she discovers women are coming out and saying this Mr. Strain guy sexually assaulted me as, as a child. I was a teenager. And you watch her re-imagine and re-discover what that relationship actually was. And you watch her realize what she actually experienced. And this is so important, I think, for people to read because it explores um, what happens with grooming and the grooming process that sexual predators do. It explains why a lot of victims have a very hard time um, understanding that they were abused and understanding that the abuser is not such a good person. Like, oftentimes people who have been abused are protective of that person. A lot of people don't understand why. It's because of the grooming process. And this explains it so beautifully. It is infuriating at times. Mr. Strain is like my least favorite character probably in all, all of the books that I've read. I probably hate him the most. Wonderful book. I'm so glad that I read that. Okay, next is 
the only thriller on the list. And no one will be surprised that it's Blue Monday. This kind of stands in for the whole Frida Klein series, which I read this year. All eight of them were fantastic. Um, this is by Nikki French, which is a, hunt, a husband and wife duo. They are fabulous. They're wonderful, wonderful writers. We are introduced to Frida Klein in this book, and she is a psychotherapist. She has a, uh, a patient who comes to her, and he has been dealing with infertility. He and his wife have been trying for years and just nothing. And he is telling her, you know, I keep dreaming of this redheaded boy and like he has red hair and so he wants this redheaded boy. And then a boy of a very similar description goes missing like three days later. And so she wonders like, did this guy do something? So she goes to the police and talks to the police about it and gets involved in the case. And that's the beginning of it. There is also a thread of the mystery that l like lingers throughout all of the books, which is why you can't just hop in and out of the series. You have to start at the beginning and then read your whole way through, which is a treat. And Frida herself is such an onion. She's a beautiful onion to unpeel. It feels like a privilege to get to know Frida because she is a bit standoffish, very kind, but standoffish and guards her heart very much. I just loved her and I miss her immensely. Coming in at number five, which is surprising because I thought this was going to be my favorite book of the year for a good long time. And that is Queenie by Candace Carty Williams. This is a contemporary story about a black woman living in London. She has a good career, but it's kind of hanging on by a thread. Um, she's desperately hoping to keep her job. Um, she is also going through a breakup, let's be honest. She doesn't fully know it though. Um, her boyfriend has moved out and said like, I need a break, we're on a break. And then months pass and she's like, it's just a break, it's just a break, but you know that they've broken up and he's moved on. And so she's having sex with all of these men who treat her improperly. They are physically, like there's some situations in here where the sexual relationships are, but they're kind of violent and she doesn't say anything. And she's just treated rudely, uh, repeatedly by many, many men. And it's it was triggering for me because it brought me back to some of my earlier dating days where I allowed myself to be treated less than by men um, and didn't just kick them to the curb. And you watch her um, develop self-respect over time. And I just loved her. I felt like she was very realistic. She's frustrating sometimes because you just want to shake her at moments, but I also wanted to hug her. I more wanted to hug her. Um, and she's got a group of friends who like stick up for her and are there for her and she calls them her corgis. I just adored this group and Queenie for sure. Number four is The Dutch House by Ann Patchett. This was such a wonderful surprise. I didn't know what to expect. I knew I liked Ann Patchett's writing. I read Bill Canto like, oh gosh, 10 years ago or even more maybe. And I really liked that, but I didn't know if I would continue to like her, but this just blew me away. This is about a sister and a brother who live in a place called the Dutch house. Their father has bought a very grand home that is in disrepair and he works on fixing it over the course of their childhood. Their mother isn't thrilled about it. Their mother actually leaves them and he remarries and he remarries a terrible woman. It's about their relationship and the importance of siblings and how only your sibling can really understand you and your childhood. And there is home in a sibling relationship. It also exp explores the importance of place and how there are certain places in, in your life that it's just magical, that is also home. Um, and so this, this sister and brother will often like drive by like years later in their adult days, they'll drive by the house or they'll like drive and stop by the house and then just sit and reminisce for hours on end. And it was wonderful. I listened to this on audio and please listen to it on audio because 
It's narrated by Tom Hanks. Oh my goodness, if he does any more, any more narration of audiobooks, I would be thrilled and would listen to anything by him because he's just fantastic. Number three is a book with probably the greatest plot twist um, I've ever read in a book. Not a thriller. It's The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. This is the first book I've read by Colson Whitehead and it will not be the last. I think he's one of the most important people writing right now. He's just stunning. Um, this is a book about a little boy, I shouldn't say little, he's actually a teenager, named Elwood. He's a black boy. He is wonderful. He's studious. Um, he has like a part-time job. He's just, he listens to a lot of Martin Luther King. Like I just, you fall in love with Elwood right away. This is a short book and I think you follow him for about 50 pages before things in Elwood's life go in a downward spiral. Um, and in those, you know, 30, 50 pages, you fall in love with him already, already. And then, um, a police officer uh, accuses him of doing something that he did not do and they move Elwood to the Nickel Academy, which is not an academy. They just call it an academy. It is a place of horrors, essentially. The boys at the Nickel Academy are being abused in every single way possible. Some boys don't make it out alive and it's based on a real place that existed in Florida, which I don't remember the name of now, but, um, and it's about his experience at the Nickel Academy, the friends that he makes, but it's incredibly heartbreaking. 200 pages packed the biggest punch. What a brilliant, brilliant book this was. I'm so glad that I read it. Number two is Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. I read this at the beginning of the year. This is a courtroom drama and it follows a cast of characters. All of them are linked by something called a miracle submarine, which is this like medical concoction that gives you like heavy doses of oxygen to help a number of ailments. So some mothers have brought their children there um, for things like uh, ADHD. Um, one man is there for infertility. And one day there is a fire that breaks out in the Miracle Submarine. Some people are killed, some people are horribly injured, and some people are fine. And one of the mothers of one of the kids being treated is on trial for having set fire to this contraption on purpose to kill her child because she can't she can't handle him it's following the case within the courtroom we follow all of these people going up to the stand to testify and we also but we we follow each and every one of the characters in their own perspectives and we get a chapter from this person a chapter from that person and you see how they in their own lives have been victimized, misunderstood, judged, and you also see them judging. And this is such a gray book. Nobody in the story is really, really good. And nobody in the story is really, really terrible. It's this mix. And I think it's such an important um lesson in the importance of not judging you don't know what someone is going through and i i really loved it i really hope that angie kim writes more courtroom dramas because she is a lawyer a trial lawyer i just think that she could do it with so many different stories she did this so beautifully and i can't wait to see what she comes out with next and the top my favorite book of the year to a lot of people might be a silly one but i was very pleasantly surprised by the southern book club's guide to slaying vampires this is a horror book by grady hendrix um this is about a a book club a women's book club in the 90s they get together excuse me, and read true crime books together. Um, uh, one day, a man moves into town and the, the main character, Patricia, thinks he's a vampire. And it goes from there. And that sounds ridiculous. And in some ways it is a little bit ridiculous. Like that is kind of funny. But at the same time, it is 
it has so much more depth to it. Um, you discover that a lot of black children are going missing and nobody, like no officials, no police officers are getting involved, trying to help. So it really explores the issues of race in here. It also explores the issues of misogyny in here. Patricia's husband is a horrible human being. And it explores that. It, and it explores female friendship, of course, these women coming together um, to fight a monster. And I loved this book. I just fell completely in love with it because it had moments of terror. There were so many gross moments in here. Grady Hendrix doesn't shy away from disgusting moments. Um, there were moments where I was truly scared. Um, but there were also moments where I felt like there was a deeper story being told here. It's definitely my favorite horror book of all time now. Um, but it, yeah, it landed into my heart and is now number one for 2020. So let me know in the comments below if you read any of these books and also what was your favorite book of 2020? I would love to know. Um, also, please like this video if you enjoyed this and also subscribe. I'd love to hang out with you more here. Hope you're doing well and I'll chat with you soon. Bye everybody.